Okay, I'm going to just share a bit of um, content with you as well. Um, I hope everybody is receiving receiving the slide. It says 4K video rooms. Um, Rob's asked me just to have a, a discussion with you um, and give you a little bit more insight into the various options when it comes to equipping uh, classrooms, meeting rooms, boardrooms, lecture lecture rooms uh, with video. Um, over the past couple of months, we've, we've deployed a number of uh, these systems at various institutions around the country. Um, we have uh, one of them, I think, online at the University of Limpopo um, in their Maths and Science Department. Uh, we have um, another one which isn't online today, but at University of Venda. Uh, WITS has two units. University of Pretoria has just finished installing one in their library. Um, the SKA has uh, two units. I think, Jeremy, you've got one running. I'm not sure about the second one yet. Um, there are two at NNMU, one in George and one in, in PE. Um, and then Tenant has uh, two or three across their various rooms as well. Um, and as Rob said, one of, the, one of the stumbling blocks that we came across last year was that where video desktop and mobile were being offered technically free of charge, although they you know, are, are being covered in, in your network, um, payments to, to tenant. When you wanted to deploy an actual video room system, there was a, a cost associated with that. Um, and, and often from a budgeting point of view, you hadn't allowed for budget for it, so it became, it became a stumbling block to deploying the product within in your organization. So with the new licensing this year, we've included a number of what we call video room software edition licenses which allow you to supply your own PC box, but convert it into a video room to use within a, a lecture or meeting room type environment. And before I run through the various uh, video room codecs that we have available, maybe I can just explain how the licensing components work and why there's a need for a separate license for room and, and, and larger audience type systems. Um, the standard video desktop and mobile licensing is a personal use license. So it's, it's licensing terms are based on, as we're doing here, one person sitting at their computer or their tablet and, and participating in a call. If you want to extend video into a environment where you've got you know, a large audience viewing or you've got a, a boardroom full of people um, using the technology, then the licensing requires you to have a video room codec. And this comes in a number of hardware um, options which we can supply to you um, and as well as this video room SE software option. Now the SE option uh, gives you the same functionality as the hardware codec options. The only difference is, is that you are required to supply the PC infrastructure or hardware that it sits on and obviously to manage the operating system where the hardware codecs are locked down and don't require any operating system management. Um, so effectively, it's like buying any other video conference system. Um, there's no additional support. Um, so that's, that's really the difference between desktop and, 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 and what we would call a room system um, and, and the deployment of that. If I can just start off with um, a sort of a, techno, a technological component of, of, of the room systems above um, the desktop and mobile devices, is that our, our high-end room system, the HD230, is a 4K enabled room system. Um, and a lot of you may, might think, well, you know, if I can get HD, why do I need 4K? Um, I think there are um, applications within the education field for 4K rooms. Um, and I'm going to just skip through some of these slides because um, some of them might not be relevant. But if you look at um, the deployment of 4K screens in environments today, if you go to Macro or Hi-Fi Corporation or any of these, probably 60% of the screens available in the consumer market today are now 
UHD enabled, 4K enabled screens. Um, and because of that, it's becoming a technology that's a little bit uh, more accessible to, to people. Where it's interesting to note for, for education purposes, the benefit of 4K um, on video conferencing is specifically around data sharing. So if you can imagine an engineering department or um, some form of, you know, your arts department or, or anywhere where really fine detail, medicine, any of these kind of applications where really fine detail is required, the difference between a standard 1080p and a 4K image are noticeable. So in the call like we're in today where we're all sending, you know, it's probably around 720p video, it's more than acceptable. But in these sort of specialist application environments, engineering, medicine, those kind of things, uh, the additional quality that you get out of a 4K image is, is, is quite important. And it allows us to be able to share high, high definition content into a call. So as I said, the, the only room system at the moment which, which handles that is our HD 230, which is a sort of high end um, room system, and I'll run through the HD 230's um, uh, specifications a little later. Um, I'm hoping everybody's getting my presentation. Rob, you seeing the presentation? Yep. Okay. So I'm going to just skip skip ahead here. Um, so one of the other um, features of the v various range of room systems is that they all have a um, user interface which is friendly, it's, it's um, easy for us to, to use. It's similar to the desktop and mobile applications where you have a presence-based phone book, as it were, where you can dock your regular users um, and, and see them online in a call offline. Um, so all of the room systems, whether they be HD 40, HD 100, HD 230, or the SE, have the same interface. Uh, they allow you to put your own background screen onto that interface, um, and then to dock regular users or search and dial from the sort of home page environment. Um, another nice feature of the video rooms across the range is that they can be integrated with your email um, programs, whether it be um, an exchange server or Google Mail or whatever it may be. And it allows you to add a email user for the video room, which allows you to, when you send a calendar invite, similar to what Rob did for this meeting, you can include the video room email and it will show up on the screen. So for instance, in this picture that you should see now, there's a green icon that says test call, and that shows that it's a video meeting. So instead of the user having to think, well, you know, whose room we're we meeting in, what's the IP address, what's this, um, they can simply walk into the room, click OK on that meeting that's popped up on their screen, and they'll be taken into the relevant meeting. It can also be used just for purely booking the room. So as you can see on the screen, the second meeting is in blue, and that shows that it's just a meeting. There's actually no video conference. It's just a meeting happening in that room at the time. So the functionality to be able to meet and, and use the room system for as a room booking process is, is, is now also there. Um, there are a variety of integrations with these room systems, one of them being a software remote control, which can be run on a um, tablet device, either iOS or Android. Um, and it gives you the sort of full functionality that the, the normal remote control that it ships with would give, with the added ability to invite people into a call. Um, so that's, that's something that's offered free of charge. You don't need to, to pay anything extra to get the software video remote. You just obviously need the hardware to run it on either an iPad or some sort of Android tablet device. And it needs to sit on the same network as the codec in order to be, to be able to, to communicate with it. Um, there's also a new video room hardware remote control with, a, with, with added features. 
So it has a QWERTY keyboard on the back of it, which makes it very easy to look up usernames instead of having to use the Lucky Clover choose ABC with arrows kind of um, mode of the older remote controls. Um, and these these remotes will start to ship with, with new systems shortly. All the video rooms also offer full integration APIs for both AMX and Crestron. So if you've got a large room that has a control system in it or are planning to put a control system in, and this is very prevalent in, uh, for instance, there's a room at WITS uh, in the Center for Excellence for Maths and Statistics where it's a very complex room. They've got multiple cameras, they've got matrix switches, they've got three screens, uh, PCs, laptops, all kinds of things which need to integrate with the video room. And in this environment, you can use AMX or Crestron control to marry all of that together and hopefully make it fairly easy, easy for the user to be able to navigate the system. I think just one, one thing to mention here, and I think um, you know, this is very important if, if it's, it's, it's good for us to say, well, we can supply these kind of technologies in lecture rooms and classrooms and things. But if we make the installation too complicated, you will find that, that, that your general lecturer won't make use of it because it's going to detract from that person being able to deliver the lecture properly. So I think it's very important in those environments to make sure that the rooms are designed in a way that they aren't too complex to use. Um, you know, sometimes the idea of multiple cameras and all of these things are, are a nice to have, but they add huge complexity to the usage of the room and, and often therefore don't get used in, in the way that they were meant to use. So, so one of the things which we've been deploying and as I, I mentioned, we've got these at, at Limpopo vendor, one's going in at Fort Hare, uh, and NNMU, are, and, and in fact one at SKA, are a, either dual or single screen video trolley with, with all, all the equipment needed for a video conference on them that you can pretty much wheel around into any, any room that you want to use it as long as it's got a network point and a PowerPoint and you can plug it into the classroom and you've got a, a system up and running. Um, and it makes it quite easy to, to deploy and use these devices across multiple rooms without having to spec every room to have access to this kind of technology. And I think uh, once I finish my presentation, Rob can maybe share a, a picture of one or two of these trolleys with you as well. So our video room portfolio um, has five systems in it. The top of the range is what we call a P600. Um, I know that Rob's chomping at the bit for somebody to buy one of these, but um, I don't hold out any hope. They're a, a six screen monster, which allows you to have up to 96 participants view it across six um, connected screens. Um, and they really for sort of high end corporate boardrooms or potentially a disaster management center or somewhere where you need to be able to view large numbers of people uh, all at the same time. Or perhaps where you've got an environment where you've got six sites connecting and you need to have each one full screen. Um, the second system is the HD230, which I'll run through with you just now. That's the sort of high-end typical system that we would see deployed. For instance, it's the system that's just been installed at the UP um, library. Um, and that allows for dual screen, both with video across both screens. So you can, in, in, a, in a typical multi-conference call, you can have a, a full screen active speaker on one and all the other people on the secondary monitor, or you can choose to split them across both screens. Um, and you can view up to uh, 16 participants per screen. So you could have a, a total of 32 participants viewable on an HD 230. The HD100 um, is a scaled down version of the 230. Uh, the main difference is uh, it doesn't have support for 4K and it only has video on one screen where the secondary monitor is reserved for data only. So it will only be live on the second monitor if you're sharing a PowerPoint or some sort of presentation into a call. The third and last of the hardware based systems is the HD40. 
Um, this is based on the Intel NUC. It's a i5 processor. It uh, will handle an um, encode of 720p only. And it's also dual screen, one screen for people, the second screen for content. And then the Video Room SE, which is the software edition. This can be either an HD 4000 or 230. It depends on the hardware you load it on. So if you load it on a PC that is spec for the HD 230 requirement, then your Video Room SE will run as an HD 230. If you load it onto an Intel NUC with an i5 processor, it will run as an HD 40. The um, HD 230, as I said, is, is, is the high-end room system. Um, it does dual 1080p screen support or a single 4K support. It's also able to encode 1080p 30. Um, and it really is for your sort of, I would think, high-end auditorium environments or large boardroom slash meeting rooms where you, where you want all the bells and whistles potentially. Um, the deployment can, as I say, be either a dual screen environment or with two, uh, or with a single HD um, 4K screen. Sorry, is there a question? I heard a mic being opened. Oh, okay, I'll keep going. Then the HD 100 is a sort of a mid-range system. As I said, this is in a way, a system that doesn't really fit into the equation because if you if you add up all the the requirements that you need in order to work for it to work, it comes in at a very close price to the HD 230. And the main difference here is that it only has one screen for content and one screen for people. It can't have people across both screens. So I don't see a lot of deployment requirements for this. I think the HD 40 is one that you will uh, probably use the most. Uh, it's, it's the most cost-effective hardware-based systems. Um, sorry, I've got the, the wrong picture there. Uh, it's based, as I said, on the Intel NUC. What, what is very nice about it is because the form factor is so small, it's very easy to just stick it behind an LED screen on a wall or potentially to allow for it on a trolley system where you don't have a lot of space to, to house um, hardware. And then the software room system, as I said, it can run all of the all of the HD 40, 100, and 230 uh, based solutions. It just depends on the spec um, that um, that um, are required. I see there's a question from John saying um, still using the Inner Genie HDMI to U USB converters. Uh, yes, those would be used for content capturing. Um, on all the systems. They come in two guises. They can either have an HDMI connector on them or a DVI connector. And they would then plug in USB into one of the codec systems to allow for um, you to capture content from a PC or a device into the equation. A very nifty way of alleviating lots of cables is to then add what we call a, a wireless presentation system to that, that inner genie data capture device, which allows you to then wirelessly capture content into the core without having to, you know, think, has the laptop got VGA, USB, D DVI, what is it going to be capture the content? So that, that HDMI inner genie will be across the, the whole spectrum for content capture. Um, on, on to the um, SE again. Um, the camera that is generally specced with that is, is a Logitech CC3000, which is a 10 times optical zoom PTZ camera. It also ships with a very nice mic and speaker array. And those you can purchase from Pinnacle, Micro, First Technologies, any of the stores, probably for about between 10 and 11,000 Rand for the camera and the audio device. Uh, they plug into all of our room systems, including the SE, and they integrate well with video. So, for instance, the, the camera control works. Uh, if you dial somebody, the name of the person will pop up on the LED screen on the Logitech. Um, so they integrate well into these systems. Um, from a, from a um, specification of the type of hardware to run the video room SE, 
If you want to run it as an HD40, you'll need to provide a computer that has an i5 processor, 8 gig of RAM, and a minimum of 64 gig of hard drive space. And unfortunately, at the moment, it only runs on Windows 7. Uh, that will change, but at the moment, it's spec to run on Windows 7. If you wanted to run an HD230, you'd need an i7 processor, also 8 gig of RAM, and a 64K, uh, 64 meg a gig hard drive, also with Windows 7. And then you would get the, the full dual screen HD230 um, specification. So I think one of the key things here is that with the, with the video room in SE, the price to deploy a proper room system dramatically increases because you need the PC, you need a camera, you need an audio device. Uh, and you've got a fully working room system, um, where in the past you would have had to go and buy one of our hardware codecs. Are there any questions at this stage? Okay, so there are, there are a number of other audio devices that one can use, a range that we we, we most frequently use, and, and it doesn't mean you have to use these, there are a number of other products on the market, um, is a range called Phoenix, made in, in America, and they've got a, a, a wide range of, of USB-based audio devices. So what we like about them is that they have very good echo cancellation in them, and they're USB-based, so they can connect easily to a PC for the audio. Uh, this system I'm showing you now is a Condor microphone array. Um, it's got a number of microphones built into the array. It's very similar to, to a, um, a sound bar that you might typically have with an, under your LED screen at home. It just sits above the screen, and it works within nine meters of the of the array. So, in a in a room where you don't want to get cabling across floors and things, this could work very nicely, as long as the room's not not more than nine meters in length, um, and it can sit in the front of the room and pick up pick up audio across the room. It would also work very well on a mobile screen where you can you know you can have it on a trolley together with a with a screen or two screens, and you can wheel it into a room and 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 use it in that way. Um, this can also uh, connect out to an amplifier or an optic input on a, a normal LED screen. So you can use um, either RCA audio through an amplifier or powered speakers, or you could use um, you could also use it connected straight to the TV. Um, if we then we then look at the uh, Phoenix Spider, the Phoenix Spider is a, a device which would sit on your on, on your table, or it can also be ceiling mounted. Um, these have four microphones and a little uh, speaker in them. Uh, they can be daisy chained, so you can add 15 of them in a daisy chain to each other. Um, and they would be ideal really for meeting rooms on boardroom tables or that kind of, kind of application. Um, the Phoenix Octopus, which is what Rob is using at the moment um, in his room, is a intelligent uh, microphone mixer device which allows you to connect any XLR type of um, uh, microphone to it. So the uh, microphones Rob's using are Bayer Dynamic uh, ceiling microphones. And I think he's trying to show us one of them. Oh no, he's showing us the octopus in the rack. And then each octopus can take up to four microphones, but you can daisy chain them if you need more than four. So if you need eight, you daisy chain two octopi together. Um, they also have a built-in amplifier, so you don't need to specify a separate amplifier in the room. There, there, there's the bad dynamic mic that um, Rob has in his room. There are four of them in the ceiling. And um, ceiling-based microphones obviously are very nice because they mean that you don't need to get cabling across any floors. They're also out of reach of the user. Um, this one happens to hang down off a, off a cable, but you also get ones that can sit flush mount almost up against the ceiling. Um, and as I said, ceiling microphones are very nice because they kind of take away the option of the user fiddling with things. So 
Typically, an octopus with ceiling mics can be housed in a rack away from your users, so they're not going to be able to fiddle with volume and, and other settings, um, which is really the biggest problem we have with, with audio in rooms. I, um, I just, Greg, I'd just like to say about the octopus, I was quite amazed, uh, having dealt with other sort of high-end audio processing, echo cancelling things, where the setup was an absolute pain, that this was just plug and play, um, literally. I just plugged it in, it seems to auto-configure itself. Yeah. And so as I say, it, you know, it will work audio from Clear One, pretty much any of those people will work with our systems. We've just found that these Phoenix units are the easiest ones to set up and use. Uh, they pretty much, as Rob said, plug and play. There's not too much in, in the form of having to set, set any settings in them, uh, where we find a lot of the other, particularly the intelligent mixers, require almost a sound engineering degree to get them to work properly. Um, so, you know, the other nice thing is that the range is quite um, large, so it's right from a personal desktop type device like the, the Phoenix Duet, which is a little um, personal speakerphone that you could just plug into your laptop, um, right up to the spider, the condor, and the, and the octopus. Um, so they kind of give you a whole range of, of options for various, various rooms.